God says, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. So the whole concept is, is to train up your children and discipline them so when they come to the place of age, there's nothing that they can't do. The mercy of God is released every time in the Bible when people are fasting. We become a team. We become a body of believers. If you get a breakthrough, she gets a breakthrough. I'll loose the gifts of healing where no cancerous cells shall ever be in my body. I loose the gifts of healing that drive out diabetes and any, any foreign sickness. I want you to take your Bible and hold it to the Lord. If you don't have a Bible, hold your hand up to the Lord. But I want everyone to make this proclamation with me out loud. Say, this is the Word of God. And I believe it's true. It's a light into my pathway. It's a lamp into my feet. This is a road map for my life. And I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. And I can be what it says I can be. In the name of Jesus. I want you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to begin reading in verse 17. Ephesians 1, 17. Would you say that, please? Ephesians 1, 17. My wife comes out of the Baptist church. My grandmother, she uh, was raised a, a Methodist. <clears throat> My grandparents on the other side attended a Presbyterian church and a Quaker church. They were out in West and they just found whatever the most spiritual church they felt. And uh, then I grew up a Pentecostal and uh, the Baptists, they believe in the water. The Pentecostals believe in the fire. So Margaret and I have been making steam, uh, as much steam as we can. But I've discovered uh, it doesn't really matter what tag you have on you. If you go to heaven, it's going to fall off. If you go to hell, it's going to burn off. <clears throat> and what is important is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I made a, a covenant with God, a vow that I have kept for over 30 years. And that is that never would a day pass I wouldn't read the Bible. And there's a strength that comes from the Bible that doesn't come from just prayer alone. Sometimes people pray and they feel good and, well, God must have heard my prayer. They pray when they don't feel good. What does that mean? God didn't hear your prayer. But the Word of God never changes. It's always the same. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it will be the same tomorrow. And <clears throat> because of the strength of God's Word, doesn't mean I have not sinned or not been... I've been perfect in any way. We're all human beings. But I've never been unfaithful to my companion. I've never stolen money. I've stayed uh, true to God. And God's word will enable you to do things that you could have never done without the power of the word of God. <clears throat> so every day I want to encourage you to read the Bible. And it changes everything. Here in Ephesians chapter 1, I want you to follow with me as I begin reading, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I want you to say God is giving me wisdom and revelation. And it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of of his power to usward who believe. Let me say that again. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he brought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, 
far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also uh, in which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over the, all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Father, anoint your word with great power in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, and you may be seated. God bless you. When I first began in the ministry, I went to Asbury Seminary. It's a Methodist school up in As Asbury, Kentucky. And one night, as I was getting ready to go to bed, I was reading the Bible, and I came across a passage in 3 John chapter 2, and it said, Beloved, I would above all things that, that, you, that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And that night, I had an experience with the Lord that literally changed my whole thinking. <clears throat> a light came on on the inside of me, and the Lord spoke to me. It's the greatest thing that I know today. It's the greatest thing that I've ever learned, and that is simply God's a good God, and the devil is a bad devil. And what it means is every good thing that happens to you in life, it comes from God. And every bad thing that comes your way, it's sent from the enemy who's trying to destroy your life. And I begin to see that when God created man, God said in all that he created, it was good. There was no sickness. There was no poverty. There was no divorce. And all of that came after man sinned. All that happened after the devil came in and the devil deceived Eve and man was tempted and fell into sin. The devil said, the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, they didn't die. They didn't die in that one day because the devil, he was confined to the realm of this world. He was confined to the time frame of a day being 24 hours. But God said, all right, you caused man to sin, but we're going under our time frame and a year is likened into a thousand days and a thousand days likened into a year. And so man lived 933 years. It took almost a thousand years. It was God's calendar of what a day was and not what the devil was. But then God spoke to the devil and he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise your head. Thou will bruise, you will bruise its heel. It was talking about the humanity of man, this outer layer of man, that the devil would have power to bruise the uh, mankind. He would bring sickness, he would bring poverty, he would bring trouble, but in the end, God would raise up from the seed of woman someone who would crush the head of the devil. He would take the authority, the power over sickness, the power over defeat, the power over sin. And he would take those keys away from the devil and he would restore it unto man. And so now begins the long march of the Holy Spirit and the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament is a story about a family, a family that believed that that promise that God was going to raise up one out of their family that would defeat the devil. That is what the Old Testament is about. The devil didn't know who that one was. And so anyone that God had his hand on, the enemy came against him, thinking maybe this is the one. This is the one that God's going to raise up that will challenge and take the authority away from me. So the enemy went after those people. But when Jesus was born in a, in a manger, he was born in Bethlehem and fulfilled every promise that the prophets said would happen. The devil did not know where Jesus was, did not know who he was. God had protected him, had placed a wall of protection round about him. The angels had come and I believe they just corded off Bethlehem because just a few miles away was Jerusalem, 
There was Herod, there was his wise men. And when the wise men came inquiring about the birth of a king, Jesus, they didn't even know where it was. And then when they came and to kill all of the babies, boys, two years and under, God warned Joseph in a dream, and they had already fled to Egypt. But Satan wants to kill, to steal, and destroy, and defeat every believer of Christ. But God has given us power over all the works of the devil. And so Jesus, when he was crucified, the Bible says he went into the bowels of the earth, and he took from the devil... With his awesome power, he took the keys from the devil. The keys to destruction, the keys to sickness, the keys to poverty, the keys to death, hell, and the grave, the Bible says. And then he took those who had died. In those days when you died, and you died in faith, you went to hell, you went to a holding place. Hell was divided into two sections. And he led those in captivity captivity out of captivity so today when we die we don't go to purgatory we don't go to some holding place the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and then that same power that he used to take from the devil all of that authority and all of that strength he had gotten from grandpa Adam he now has given that authority back to us. And it says here in the Bible, it says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? That's us. He gave that same awesome power that he, had give, that he used to defeat the devil. He gave that power to us. And that is the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. We have authority over all the works of the devil, over everything that Adam, what uh, he experienced, he experienced health, he experienced blessing. When that was taken away by the enemy, God has given us the authority that Adam once had to have healing, to have strength, to be restored to that place where God called us to be. If you believe that, would you say amen? amen? And so in the new covenant is what we call a, a doctrine of spiritual warfare. It's a doctrine of authority that we have over every demon and devil and over everything that they would usher into our lives. This is why we believe that we can be healed. This is why we believe that God can restore to us what the devil has taken away. It's called spiritual uh, uh, warfare. That concept was never in the Old Testament. But it is a New Testament concept, and it is something that Jesus brought when he defeated de the devil and uh, overcame him at the grave. Now, I want to share just for a moment how the spiritual warfare works. In uh, the early 1800s, God began to move and God began to prepare the way for Israel to go back to uh, come back to become a nation. The prophecies in the Bible always said there would be the nation of Israel, even though in 70 AD they were uh, defeated by the Romans in, uh, during the times of 583 AD uh, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came. He began to uh, take the, uh, take the uh, Jewish people, and they were dispersed over the world. 61% ended up in the Soviet Union. But the prophecies were, came that before the Lord would come back, the Jews would be restored to their nation. There was the prophecy that was given to Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 38, 39. Those dry bones... Can those bones live again? And he began to prophesy over those bones. And he prophesied that those bones would come together and that the breath of God would breathe upon those bones. And those bones came back to life. 
And the Bible says those bones are the nation of Israel. Well, for this to happen, God raised up America. Because to birth a nation, they had to have a big brother. They had to have someone that militarily was strong enough to protect them so no one would destroy them. And that's why God raised up America. They gave him a gift of, of prosperity. America became the most prosperous nation in the world to help finance the spreading of the gospel. And also militarily, they became a nation that could not be even rivaled. And so God had to raise up a man, and his name was Blackstone. William Eugene Blackstone. He was a Methodist man. He wasn't a preacher. But he moved to Chicago from New York, and he began a business, of a building business. But God began to move upon him, and he wrote a book. And that book sold over a million copies when the whole population of America was only 50 million people. Jesus is coming. And then in chapter 15, and I have that book, in chapter 15, he had over 83 prophecies that told before uh, the Lord would come back, Israel would be established as a nation. When he began to share this, it was just like sliced bread. It was the greatest thing anybody ever heard. D.O. Moody got a hold of it. A man by the name of Schofield, who later would write the Schofield Bible, he began to put all those promises in there. And then Blackstone began to go to every president from Harding all the way to Roosevelt, over seven presidents he visited personally to encourage them to stand with Israel. Israel would become a nation. Now, anytime you take on something like that, don't you think the enemy would rise up against you? Don't you think the demons of hell would come and attack your family and attack your children? Well, that's what happened to Blackstone. Everything you could imagine came against him, but he stood his ground in faith. He rebuked it in the name of Jesus, and he pressed on. He formed what was called the Blackstone, uh, the Blackstone Memorial, and he went and had over 450 prominent Americans, including three uh, three chief justices, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, uh, um, Morgan, uh, who was the great banker. He had all these people to sign this, and he presented it to the president to support the Jews. And so he began to prepare the Christians and prepare this country to believe in the Jewish people that God was going to use our country to help establish a homeland for the Jews. Well, at the same time, God raised up a Jewish man. And the Jews in those days did not want to go back to their homeland. They were happy. Uh, they were successful. It, it would be like if someone immigrated here from Guatemala. They immigrated from an area where there wasn't maybe electricity or running water. And now they come and they are well off, They're, they have a home, their children are educated, they are married, they don't even speak Spanish anymore. And now to say, why don't you go back to, your, to Guatemala? It has no appeal to them. But so God had to allow certain things to happen to get the Jewish people's attention. And it happened with a trial in the late 1800s of a, a, a Jewish officer in the French army, his name was Dreyfus. And when the French had been defeated by the, by the Germans, they had to come up with some reason, and they blamed it all on this Jewish officer. It was just a kangaroo trial. And a man by the name of Theodore Herzl, who was a secular Jew, who was never raised in the synagogue, he, he didn't know if something was New Testament or Old Testament. He had married a Catholic lady, and even though he was an attorney, he was a writer for the newspaper. Well, he came to cover this story, and he saw right then that if the Jews were ever going to make it because of the anti-Semitic attitudes that were just instilled in Europe, they needed to have their own homeland. So he wrote a book. He wrote a book about Zionism, and he became the father of Zionism. 
And so here on one side, God raised up a Christian man to prepare America that Israel would become a nation biblically. And on the other hand, he raises up a Jewish person to stir up the Jews to say, listen, if you're going to survive in the long run, you're going to need to go back to Palestine and we're going to need to have our own country. But I want you to see just a moment the difference. Here is a Jewish person who was never raised to serve God. He approached it strictly in a secular manner. And the same devil attacked Blackstone and the same devil attacked uh, Herzl. But Herzl with no, no foundation in the word of God. And the fact is he said he was an atheist. When his son was born, he wouldn't even have him circumcised. And his uh, wife, she went insane. She eventually would die in a mental institution. His one daughter died of a heroin overdose. His second daughter, she was uh, eventually killed in Auschwitz in the German concentration camps. His son jumped off a building in uh, London. His grandson, the only grandson he had, an only survivor, he would jump off a bridge and commit suicide. And then Herzl, eventually, he died of tuberculosis uh, as a young man. Now what happened in these cases? The devil came against them, but the power to stand and resist the devil was in one man and it was not in the other. And it's the same is true today. God has given us power over all the works of the devil. The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 10, it says, lo, I've given you power over, over serpents and scorpions and power over all the works of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm thee. Now, that applies to those that will stand and resist and come against and not give in to the works of the enemy. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, here, um, a few years ago, I was on a 40-day fast, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to continue this fast for 100 days. And I said, and I'll die too. I, I was really struggling at the end of these 40 days, and, uh, but I fasted on until Easter. It was 100 days. I lost uh, almost 60 pounds. I, I, uh, I would eat a little bit of food after starting those last 60 days. But I continued fasting as best I could. During that time, the Lord sent me to Palestine. I went next, uh, uh, just down the street from the headquarters of Hamas in Ramallah. We met with the prime minister of the Palestinians and, and God miraculously moved upon him and they granted us permission to build a Christian television station in Bethlehem. Now, that's never happened before. There have been greater people than I have that have tried and pursued this. Pat Robertson, he tried in 700 Club. They never allowed CBN to do this. A Trinity Broadcasting even gave Arafat a half a million dollars, and he still never uh, did it. But I really believe it was through the power of spiritual warfare. And fasting becomes a part of that spiritual warfare to come against the demons and the oppressive forces. Well, when that happened, all hell broke loose against me. Uh, there was a trouble and stuff. I was almost killed in an airplane. It just went on and on and on. And I saw that I really had to get a prayer cover to continue because you're fighting the same demons that fought against Jesus, the same demons that fought against Elijah and the prophets in that part of the world. And so, what? To, but to show how the demonic begins to work, that station, God began to bless that station. And that station has now become the number one station in all of Palestine. Well, this uh, war broke out, and it's been going now in, on its uh, uh, second month. And we were unable to get monies over there to support that station. And it, it became very critical to the place that we needed to go over there 
and actually give the money because the wire transfers were being frozen uh, on the Israeli side and it could take maybe 60 to 90 days for them to release finances. And so a door opened, a door opened with Kufi, Christians United for Israel. And they needed a representative from Kentucky and so we sent uh, Rachel. And Rachel went over there for that conference and she took that money. We delivered it there to the station. And a part of that, uh, they met in these meetings and she, uh, she went down to the, west, to the uh, Gaza and there were pictures that were taken. She was taking pictures. And these uh, pictures uh, got on the website, somehow fell into the hands of Hamas. And then Hamas began to put Rachel's picture, began to put what we showed on the video here at our church. And oh, they had over a million hits, Hamas, and they used that as a poster child uh, against Rachel. And then they became threats, death threats. And I remember uh, as, as this all has begun to unfold this week, uh, you talk about getting upset and disturbed and then the threats, they came in and the security took our manager and they threatened to kill the uh, people that work in our station. And so we were praying and uh, I, I said to Margaret, I said, you know, Margaret, God gave us that station and the enemy has come. And we can either roll over and die or we can stand and we can rebuke and stand against the devil in Jesus' name. So in the midst of this, I was asleep and an angel came to me at 3.33 in the morning. And I got up and as I began to pray, the Lord spoke to me and said, now I'm going to give a peace. This is going to calm down. You're going to continue broadcasting this station. And the greatest days ahead in a great revival is headed for Israel and to the Palestinians. And this station is going to be a major player in helping to usher in the work of God. And God, and God uh, gave that promise to me. You see, the devil wants to come and he wants to stir up trouble. He wants to stir up trouble in your life. And so the doctor announces some uh, a sickness that you have. Or there's trouble in your family. And at first it comes and great fear comes upon you. But you must rise up in the name of Jesus. And you must take authority in the name of Jesus over every attack on your life. And everything the devil tells you, God will do the opposite in the name of Jesus. Because the devil's a liar in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Today I have three promises, I, I, uh, four promises I want to share with you. I want you to write them down. If you're going to get a tattoo this week, go get this tattooed on you. <laughs> the first promise is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 81, verse 10. It says this, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out, uh, out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. E Egypt represents the world. When they were in Egypt, they, had, uh, they, they were sickly. They were a sickly group. They had built those pyra pyramids. They were a weak and feeble group of people. They were impoverished. They had been slaves for 400 years. But the Bible says in Psalms 105, he brought them forth with silver and with gold, and there was not a feeble one amongst the tribes. God healed every one of them. God gave them favor. They went and borrowed the money from the Egyptians, and they came out millionaires. They came out wealthy people. Now, the Bible says we're to open our mouth wide, and God will fill it. That doesn't mean to open your mouth wide like you're going to eat some mashed potatoes, but it means pray big prayers. Pray prayers that, that stretch your faith. If you need a $1,000 answer, don't be praying a $10 prayer. Pray prayers not that you can accomplish, but pray prayers that only God can accomplish in the name of Jesus. Rise up in faith and believe God for miracles to take place. Years ago, 
our church was located on an off straight. And we were struggling as a church. And uh, the, uh, we'd gotten behind on our payments. And one night we prayed that God would save a millionaire. And he would come to our church and he would pay his tithe and help us to get out of debt. Well, that's a prayer that, that for some people it's, it's like a lottery ticket. But it was a prayer we prayed in faith, believing God. Two weeks later, down the aisle, walked a little white-headed man with a white suit, with a string boat tie. He had a goat tee. It was Colonel Sanders. Sat right down on the front row when the altar call was given. The old colonel got up, and he was the first one at the altar. My dad went and began to pray with him, and the colonel says, Brother Rogers, do you believe that God could save me where I'd quit cussing? Every other word he said was a cuss word. He'd go out the door and said, Preacher, that was the blankety-blank best sermon I ever heard in my life. But that night, the old colonel really got born again. I mean, he really got saved. And uh, he left a check in the offering, and it was a check that we just, I mean, just was a miracle check that we needed to pay uh, the bills that week. But two weeks passed, and my dad got on an airplane. He was going out to Houston to preach. And right there in the first class was Colonel Sanders. He said, oh, Brother Rogers, he said, I, I've wanted to call you. Where, where are you sitting? My dad was sitting in the back of the plane. And he said, well, I'll come back and see you in a little bit. And so uh, after the plane got airborne, the colonel came back. And of course, the colonel was the most uh, recognized human being in the world. Not in America, but in the world. And he came back, and when he started talking to my dad, the whole airplane just hushed, and everybody was listening. And he leaned over. My dad was in the middle. He said, Brother Rogers, he said, you know, since you prayed with me, I haven't cussed one time. And he said, uh, what I'd like to do is give a tithe check to the church. He says, you think you could come over to my house when you get back from Houston? My dad said, yes, Colonel, I'll be right over. And uh, the Colonel wrote out a tithe check. And that tithe check got our church out of debt. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. That was the weakest amen I've heard. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise clap. Unlocking the secrets of the ongoing battle for your soul is a battle you have great control over. From the words of the Bible to the daily life you live, Jesus has given you the power of spiritual warfare. Call now with your best gift to the ministry. 1-888-613-6080 and ask for Understanding Spiritual Warfare on CD or DVD. You can also receive your copy online at bobrogersministries.org. Understand spiritual warfare in this new teaching from Bob Rogers Ministries. Don't miss your opportunity to hear from God at the 2014 Prophetic Summit at Evangel, November 16th through the 18th at the 6900 Billtown Road Campus. Hear from some of the top prophetic men and women in the world today and receive personal prophecies for you and your family. What does God have in store for you? November 16th through the 18th at Evangel, Be part of the annual Thanksgiving prayer service on Thanksgiving morning at 7 a.m. This one-hour service is a great way for your family to spend the first part of the day thanking God for all His blessings. So join Pastor Bob and Margaret Rogers at the Evangel World Prayer Center, 6900 Billtown Road, Thanksgiving morning from 7 to 8 a.m. for the Thanksgiving prayer service. anymore and and God miraculously allowed them all to get out of jail every one of them became a preacher 
Every one of them began to be pastors. Uh, one was a, an evangelist. Jack Vibbert was a, an evangelist in the Methodist church. Hansel Vibbert, he, he pastored a great church in Evansville. Ted Vibbert, he pastored one of the largest churches in America in Indianapolis. And it all was because of a, of a little eighth grade education of a, of a mother who began to believe God can do anything but fail. And she began to pray and believe God. I want you to believe God that God will save your family in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There was a mother praying for her son. He was so wild. He had joined the Navy, got into the Merchant Marines. He was out on the West Coast, out on a, a ship, and a storm came. He had to go up on deck, and a wave came and washed him right off that ship. And he said, God, if you'll save me, I'll serve you, and I'll become a preacher. The next wave picked him up and put him right back on the ship. When he got to Seattle, he, said, he found a church. He, uh, he got baptized, he, and he became a preacher and became one of the great pastors in uh, Seattle, Washington. What was it? It was the prayers of a mother. Let me tell you the third promise I want you to believe God for is Acts 10, 38. And it says, Jesus Christ went about doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. How many know that God's a healer? Come on, how many know that God is a healer? When I was a senior in high school, I broke my socket in my shoulder. We are playing football, and I broke the socket off, and then I broke it down just a little below there, two places. I was in the hospital 45 days, and my arm quit growing. It uh, was, uh, I was having a withered arm, and the doctor had done everything he had done for me, and a Baptist preacher came in. He was friends of my dad. Filled with the Holy Ghost, said, Bob, this is uh, not the work of God. This is the work of the devil. And God has sent me here to pray for you and to believe that God will heal you. And God healed me. God healed me. My arm's not withered. My arm's strong and healthy in the name of Jesus because of the prayers of God's people. Hallelujah. I thank God for every doctor. I thank God for all those in the medical business, but Jesus is the healer. Jesus is our healer in Jesus' name. And I lay your hands on yourself right now. I want you to say with me in Jesus' name, I'll not have cancer nor diabetes. I'll not die before my time, but I shall live out my days in my allotted time in strength in Jesus' name. There was a man by the name of Charles Page. He was a multimillionaire in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Made his money in oil. His wife became very ill. And so he said, Lord, if you will heal my wife, I'll begin to help the poor. And uh, nothing happened. So he finally said, well, I think I'll just help the poor anyway. It's, it's the right thing to do. And when he did, God instantly healed his wife. Instantly healed her of cancer. Now, there's a great promise in the book of Proverbs, chapter 12, verse 28. Proverbs 12, 28. Say, I love that scripture. Say, that's my favorite scripture. Say, that's my favorite scripture. In Proverbs 12, 28, it says, the way of righteousness, or the proper translation is the way of charity. There is life. And in the pathway, there is no death. In the way of charity, there is life. Now, nobody knows how long we're going to live. God has given to every person an allotted amount of years. But the Lord says here that if you will help those in need, if you'll help the poor, if you'll feed the hungry, that God will, uh, two things can happen. Number one, that God will extend your days. And if God does not extend your days, at least you will not die before your allotted time. And then it says, and in the pathway, there's no death. Or in other words, it is not a death spiritually, but God will reward you. And God will bless you for your righteousness sake. And so the allotment of years, we will not die before our time or our lives will be extended because we've helped the poor. I'm going to live to be over 90 years of age. 
because I've helped the hungry, fed the hungry. I've clothed the naked. I have helped the poor in the name of Jesus. My dad died when he was 61. My uncle died when he was 58. My grandmother died when she was 60. My grandfather died in his late 40s. But I'm going to outlive them all in the name of Jesus. Because I stand on this promise and believe, believe that God's going to fulfill it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Don't give in to sickness. Don't give in to it in the name of the Lord. Rebuke it. Bind it. Come against it. Do everything in your power to get well. And God will honor your prayers. Hallelujah to Jesus. I want to share one more promise, and that promise is in Deuteronomy 8.18. And this is what it says. Thou shalt remember, it's the Lord thy God that gives thee power to make wealth for the establishment of the covenant. God will give us an anointing to prosper and to be blessed. I don't care what the economy is like. I operate in the economy of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings of heaven. The blessings of the Lord maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. The first thing that happens when you come to this church is you make more money. Now, I can't help it. It's just the blessing of God in here. You can go into churches and you can get saved, but you can't get healed because they don't believe in healing. You can go into some churches and you can get saved and you can get healed, but you can't prosper because they don't believe in prosperity. <clears throat> and the Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And if I were to get up and I was to preach that God doesn't want you to be blessed, that God doesn't want you to prosper, and then you turned around and prospered, and you got blessed, you'd be under condemnation. So there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is the same. He's the same back then as he is now. Back in the days of Christ, the greatest miracle that was performed was the miracle of multiplication in John chapter 6. It was a miracle that more people participated in. Probably 30,000 people participated in the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. There were five loaves and two fishes, and it said 5,000 men were fed, not counting women and children. Wherever there's a man, there's a woman. And where there's a man and a woman, there are children. And so every, every commentary you read says there's anywhere from 20 to 30,000 people that were part of that. And so it is in every, that miracle is in every gospel. No other miracle is in all four gospels. Just that one. The miracle of multiplication. And that miracle is what happens when you give to God. When you honor God and you give to God's work, God takes and he multiplies it back to you. Just like he multiplied that back to that boy and there were 12 baskets left over. And so it became the symbol of Christianity, the fish. If you were an early uh, believer <coughs> and you, and you uh, would travel to Corinth and you would wonder where a church is, you'd look for the sign of the fish. It was a sign of multiplication. It was a sign that God would bless them. That God would take anything that they gave to him and he'd multiply it. If you went to Ephesus, if you went to any place in Turkey, if you went to any place in the Middle East, when you saw that sign of the fish, God wants to multiply your life. <coughs> and that is a sign of an increase. And I'm here to declare to you that God will bless you God will increase you. And when we talk about God giving you power to prosper, that's what the Lord will do. I want to share very briefly in closing some of the ways that I believe that God can bless you even this month. One is found in Genesis 31, 11, where, where uh, Jacob had an angel come to him. And that angel began to show him how to prosper. It's called the angel of prosperity. Raise your right hand. Say in Jesus' name, send the angel of prosperity to me. 
I believe that God supernaturally can send his angels, can direct people across your pathway for you to increase and be blessed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I loose the angel of blessing to come to your people in Jesus' name. Secondly, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Would you say that with me? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do you believe that God can lead you to directions where you can prosper and you can be blessed and you can increase in the name of Jesus? I do. My, my wife, Margaret, was raised in Corbin, Kentucky. Can anything good come out of Corbin, Kentucky? <laughs> Margaret came out of Corbin. And uh, she was working. Uh, there was a divorce in their family, and the girls were working to try to help support the family. And uh, she began to work for a doctor, a dentist. And this dentist uh, took interest in... Uh, in uh, Margaret, and he and his wife came to her and said, we, uh, we want to help you to go to college. And they helped her to go down to Cumberland College. They helped make a way. The Holy Spirit can lead you and direct you and guide you in the name of Jesus. He can show you and send people across your pathway that can open the right doors and close the wrong doors in Jesus' name. So pray that God will release the angel of prosperity. Pray that God will direct your pathway. And then in Luke 6, 38, it says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will men give unto your bosom. And with the same measure you give, it will be given back to you. Pray and say, Lord, I remind you that I'm a tither. I remind you that I have planted seeds. In Psalms uh, 22, it, David is writing, he said, Lord, remember my offerings. Remember how I've given offerings and answer my uh, offerings with, with answers to prayer. Well, remind the Lord you're a giver. It always comes back in Jesus' name. There was a, a banker, his name was John Beal, was, uh, uh, was the president of First National Bank in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, he was going to uh, Oklahoma City on business. And on his way back that evening, he, he had a flat tire. And if you've ever driven from Oklahoma City to Tulsa, it can be a desolate uh, time. And when it gets cold in Oklahoma, it really gets cold. That wind will blow right through you. And it was snowing. And he had gotten out and he had tried to uh, changed that tire and he couldn't do it and he got back in the car and he began to he was praying he, he was very getting very concerned it was now almost midnight he didn't know what to do and about that time an 18 wheeler pulled behind him and a trucker got out of the car and he had knocked on the window he said uh, pop your trunk he said I'll, I'll take care of this just stay in your car and so he changed the tire for this banker and uh, the banker says, well, listen, what, what I owe you? He says, you don't owe me anything. I just pay him my good deed for the day. And the banker gave him a card. He said, I want to give you my business card. He said, I'm the president of the First National Bank in Tulsa. And uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to open an account for you. And I'm going to put some money in that account. And if you ever need it, you come on by and it'll just be a payback. Well, the months passed. And nothing happened. And about six months later, a lady came into Mr. Beal's office and says, you know, there's a guy down there that says that uh, uh, you opened an account for him. And he said, what's his name? And he told him, he said, well, that's a guy who helped me. And he went down and he, he talked to him. He says, yes. He said, I've opened an account here and I put $200 in that account just for you. And he gave him that money. Well, you know, that's what God does for us. He opens an account in heaven. And that when you give to God and you honor God and you help the poor and you help those in need, God takes all that into account. And the day comes 
when you have needs. The day comes when your family has needs. The Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. You know why? Because the righteous have helped the poor. They've given to God, and they have an account in heaven, and when their family has needs, God always gives back in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want you to lay your hand right here on your chest. I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, you have a plan for my life. I ask in the name of Jesus, you'd take out of me what the devil's put in my life and put back in me what the devil's taken out of me. Devil, you're a liar. You have no rights over my future. You have no rights over my family. Lord, cleanse me from every sin. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my life. Cleanse my past and prepare my future for what you have for me to do. Now with every head bowed, if you're here and you say, Pastor, my family's under a real spiritual attack and I want you to pray for my family. Can I see your hand? Just slip your hand up right now. Yes. Yes. How many are here and, and Satan has attacked even your marriage? Can I see your hand? Hold your hand up. God knows how to heal your marriage. How many are here and you say, Pastor, I need God to bless me financially. I'm in a situation. I need there to be a turnaround. Can I see your hand? How many are here and you're struggling with a sickness or disease in your body? Hold your hand up. If you raise your hand, I want you to stand right now. I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to meet you and that this month, the month of the month of August will be a month of miracles in Jesus' name. August is the month of the greatest answers to prayer in the Bible. It's a month when the greatest attacks come upon people's lives. But it's a month when God's people rise up and they nail to that cross the greatest miracles, the greatest financial victories, the greatest turnarounds, they're in the month of August. Hallelujah. This is your month. This is your month for great miracles in Jesus' name. If you believe that, say, I believe it. I believe it. If you believe it, say, I better I believe it. I Place your hand right here now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, there's some things we can do, but there's some things we can't do. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would do those things that we don't have the power to do but you do. Lord, I command every demon that's come against your family, against your children, against your marriage to be broken off of you in Jesus' name. I speak health and strength and long life over our bodies. May you weigh less. May you feel stronger. May you be more handsome and more beautiful at the end of August than it was at the beginning of August. May God take every pain out of your body. May God heal you in the name of Jesus. May God heal your back and your knees and your joints and your heart and your lungs. May God restore health to you. And I speak God's prosperity upon your life. I rebuke every attack on your finances. Lord, I remind you that you've given us power, power to make wealth. I remind you, Lord, that you answered prayers. You said open your mouth wide and you would fill it. I speak the miracles of God. I want us all to stand right now. I want you to begin to pray now for your family. I want you to pray that God would send a revival in your home. I want you to speak out loud every member of your family. If you have grandchildren, speak their names out. If you have brothers and sisters, speak their names out to the Lord. <coughs> Father, we bind every attack on our families. We pray in the name of Jesus for revival to come in our homes. I pray for Justin and for Jessica. I pray for Rachel. I draw a circle about my children. Devil, you can't have my children in the name of Jesus. I pray for Jacob. I pray for Landon. I pray, God, your will be done in their lives. May they become mighty men of God. May they be truthful and honest. May they be people of character. I pray for Margaret, Lord, that you would bless her life. I, I pray great things for our families. Now bind the devil. Tell the devil to get out of your family. 
Devil, take your hands off of our homes. Get out of our household in the name of Jesus Christ. Now lay both hands right here on your chest. Say, in Jesus' name, may I have a pure heart, a healthy heart, a healthy body. I declare by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Now lay your hand on the person next to you or join their hands. I want you to pray for them like you'd like them to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for one another. We pray for our husbands. We pray for our wives. We pray for our family. And Lord, I speak your blessings. I speak your strength. I speak your direction. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that our decisions would be the right decisions. Our decisions would be decisions that bless our future in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. Now lift your right hand to the Lord. I speak God's blessings upon you. God's prosperity upon you. May this be a miracle month. May this be a time that you pay your credit cards off that God helps you to get ahead in Jesus' name, that God opens the right doors for you and he closes the wrong doors in the name of Jesus. May you prosper and be blessed. May your family be blessed in Jesus' name. Unlocking the secrets of the ongoing battle for your soul is a battle you have great control over. From the words of the Bible to the daily life you live, Jesus has given you the power of spiritual warfare. Call now with your best gift to the ministry. 1-888-613-6080 and ask for Understanding Spiritual Warfare on CD or DVD. You can also receive your copy online at bobrogersministries.org. Understand spiritual warfare in this new teaching from Bob Rogers Ministries. Don't miss your opportunity to hear from God at the 2014 Prophetic Summit at Evangel, November 16th through the 18th at the 6900 Billtown Road Campus. Hear from some of the top prophetic men and women in the world today and receive personal prophecies for you and your family. What does God have in store for you? November 16th through the 18th at Evangel, Be part of the annual Thanksgiving prayer service on Thanksgiving morning at 7 a.m. This one-hour service is a great way for your family to spend the first part of the day thanking God for all His blessings. So join Pastor Bob and Margaret Rogers at the Evangel World Prayer Center, 6900 Billtown Road, Thanksgiving morning from 7 to 8 a.m. for the Thanksgiving prayer service.